Metro Louisville is made up of 26 districts. This podcast gives you a chance to connect with your council member and learn about what's going down in your district. Welcome back to District Download. Thank you everyone for joining us. We have a packed room here in the studio and kicking things off yet again, Council President David James. Welcome back. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Of course. You didn't mess up the last time or That's the time right. before that. So I, I, guess we'll, come back. I guess we'll bring you back on. Um, okay, so let's kick things straight off to our topic, because I know you and I were talking about this. Um, and let's start with the reason as to why we want to talk about financial literacy. Anyone listening to this podcast, don't tune out just at those two words. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's exciting. It is. We're going to make it exciting, and that's the whole point. But why? Why did we want to talk about this topic? You know, I think it's important that we talk about this topic because a lot of people don't get to have it spoken to them. And so um, oftentimes as I'm traveling through the city and talking to folks and, and trying to explain some things, for example, they'll say to me, well, why do we have so many abandoned houses on this block? And then when I actually look into it, if there's 10 houses that are abandoned on the block, eight of them are because nobody left a will. And so um, it creates this, uh, this issue. And so um, young people quite often uh, don't even concern themselves with financial literacy until, um, until they're in financial trouble. And so I think it's very important that we all think about that and talk about that and, and know that we live in the United States of America that is based upon capitalism. So if you don't understand financial literacy, then your ability to succeed uh, has some limitations. So great start to this conversation. And when you brought this and said, hey, I want to talk about this, the first thing going through my head was, oh, gosh, this is going to be complicated. How are we going to do this? And you brought some wonderful guests to the table I with did. you I today. Have, I did. I've got uh, Rob and PJ. And uh, they are the financial literacy wizards, uh, and so <laughs> those are, are your new titles <laughs> that can right. go on business cards at this point. <laughs> yep. And, and so, um, and so I, I brought them uh, to to be able to be on the podcast, and I want to say thank you for coming and, and welcome. And yes, welcome. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Let's learn a little bit about both of your backgrounds. Um, who wants to kick it off? And then that'll kind of help frame the conversation for us. Sure. Um, I can go ahead and kick it off. Um, my name is PJ Banasor, and I'm a financial representative with Northwestern Mutual um, here in downtown Louisville. So my name is Rob King. Thanks for having us join you. I'm also at Northwestern Mutual, and this is now my 19th year in financial uh, literacy. Okay. So it's Fair to say we have experts with us at the table. It's a lot of years of expertise. <laughs> right. There we go. Um, so let's understand a little bit more about your background in that. Why is this so important to you? You've made careers out of this. Let's talk about that. Sure. sure. So um, for me personally speaking, I wanted to be a catalyst, right, in, in assisting as far as the direction in which the community can go. And I think um, sometimes you'll see that, uh, whether it be not having the opportunity to ask certain questions or, um, in other cases, not deeming some of the uh, resources that we do have as far as a level of importance or priority, uh, I wanted to be an advocate in making sure that, um, you know, we, we start to do those things. And how about yourself? So it's interesting. Money has a, a stigma that comes along with it. Um, you mentioned, you know, people not necessarily having the tools or the resources to make decisions. Money is one of the few things that everyone is expected to know how to use, right? We're expected to know how to use it, how to spend it, how to save it, but it's not taught. It's a, <laughs> maybe you can work on this. There's no education at the middle school or high school level. You get to college, and depending on your major, there's no education there. You could go on to grad school, get no education there, and then come out as a full-fledged adult, and people expect you to make, you know, mature decisions when it comes to money, whether it's doing your taxes, buying a house, you know, paying back your student loans, and you've had no formal training around what to do with it. And so for me, it, it was one of those things that I've always been really intrigued by the fact that everyone uses it on a daily basis, but no one ever sits down and says, hey, this is how you approach it. And there's a level of scariness 
I feel like that's a very weak word to use, <laughs> but it, if you aren't being taught from a young age that money is not scary and that it can be used to your benefit, then how would you know by the time you get out of college, what do I do with this? It's mm -hmm. just all overwhelming at that point. So is there a level of, you know, for any of your clients or people you talk to or community groups that you're with of just kind of taking that scare factor out of money? It's every day. I mean, it, it's, it's truly remarkable to meet someone for the first time who is completely intimidated by money, spend some time with them to, to debunk some of the myths and mysteries about money. And at the end, you can see the light bulb go off where all of a sudden there's a comfort level that they didn't have at the beginning of the conversation. So with the work that you're doing, how does this impact the community around you? I think um, kind of back to the point as far as the household is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the foundation of the work that we do, um, you know, starts at home, right? I think um, um, in our community and, and in the household in particular, the conversation around money is taboo, right? Uh, I mean, as I kind of reflect, uh, you know, trying to understand, hey, dad, how much do you make, right, as a kid? Or, hey, mom, how much how much do you make uh, per hour? Or wh what does your salary look like? And I think... Um, given the work that we do, if we can partner in such a way where, you know, we kind of encourage each other that, hey, these conversations should in fact be normal and they are normal. Um, and, you know, uh, it's kind of important for us to, you know, start with the kids at a, at a young age and, and kind of build from there. Yeah. So it, it's really interesting because there's a sense of normalcy when it comes to a lot of these things in life. Right. And so now, David, I'm going to put you on the spot. All right. Okay. Here we go. Who taught you how to tie your shoes? Uh, my dad. Right. And so with money, oftentimes your parents teach you what they know how to do. And for a lot of us, either our parents or our grandparents probably work somewhere where they had a pension. Well, then our parents had a 401k, and now things are a little bit different now for this generation in the gig economy. So your parents can't teach you what they don't know. Right. And so when you look back at them, they say, hey, what should I do with money? Well, if you're talking to your grandparents, they're going to say, work somewhere for 40 years and you're going to be okay. It's not the reality for a lot of people today. So the conversations we have are a little bit different in educating people on where they are and what they need to do when it comes to money. What do you think is missing when it comes to that link in educations, whether it's from the school side or just from the family side? We kind of touched on that mm -hmm. at the very beginning. We're missing some links here. So what is it that we can address? Okay, go for this or go for this or this topic, or if you don't know, then ask someone. Well, I think it is a lot of the I don't know because I've spent time, I've been in <laughs> more high schools than I can count volunteering to share that information. And oftentimes it's because I've had a relationship with a teacher that just says, hey, come talk to my students, they have questions. And what I found is they were confident enough or took the courage to say, I don't know, can you come help me? And I think there is that stigma and that, that, uh, I think you said scariness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the word I Where people don't want to raise their hand and say, I don't know. Okay. I, I think you're right. I think especially the older you get, I think people are like, well, maybe I, I, should, I should have been expected to know this by the time I was 25, but now I'm 45 and I, I still don't know. So I don't know if I want to raise my hand and say, hey, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think it, I think finding ways to make people comfortable saying I don't know is, is important. Absolutely. Well, I'm curious from a metro side too, how do you see this from a local government side impacting you know, the constituents that come to you or the problems you see in the neighborhood or even if it's not understanding you know, how the budget goes through metro right. council? There, there's so many factors to simply understanding your own finances, but finances as a whole and how a city even functions. Yeah, I, I think that it, it's complicated also. I think it's scary because uh, I, I often rant about uh, people calling and asking me questions that I think that everybody should know. And then I go, well, you know, with JCPS, uh, civics is a, a uh, an elective course. It's mm -hmm. not a mandatory course. And so when I'm out in the public and I start talking about capital budgets and operational budgets and people's eyes glaze over and I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, that we just expect you're going to know these things, you know, and I, I, when you were talking, I was thinking about my, my father when I was a young child and he, he helped me because every, 
every month he would have a budget and he would write it in his three ring binder mm -hmm. and he would keep up with everything and he would total it down to the end, how much went to savings, how much were going to go to bonds, U.S. savings mm -hmm. bonds, uh, how much was going to be in the life insurance policy, which was whole life policies mm -hmm. back then. And, and I would be asking questions and he would have this, this adding machine shows you how old I was, and he would pull the handle and go, and I remember I was probably maybe 12 years old, and we got a Texas instrument calculator, yeah. wow. and, and you know, punch it, and it didn't have paper or anything that came out of it, but it had numbers on it, and the, my biggest thrill in life was him telling me what numbers to punch in, and hitting add or subtract, and, and then eventually he let me start writing in the book, yeah. and that's when I knew that I was getting older. Um, there you go. And, and so, but, you know, I, I think about that. Um, had he not done that, I, I would have not have known anything, right? Because nobody at school ever told me, not even when I was going to L. And so um, when I talk to citizens and we start talking about that and they'll start talking to me because uh, they're older now mm -hmm. and they're too old to be out in the workforce and they had no opportunity to plan to be in the position they're, they're in and now they're 75 or 80 years old trying to figure out how they're going to survive. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that we're having this conversation. And, and I, some of those things that people use, some of those instruments mm -hmm. that people should be using or considering, could you talk about some of that? Well, so it, it's fascinating you mentioned the conversation you had with the adding machine. Because what we see is that that conversation doesn't happen anymore because of technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, the and this is, this is not a dig against capitalism, but it is what it is, society has made it to a point that money doesn't feel like money. You know, when you were young and you went to the store and you wanted to buy something, you had to actually get your money out, count it, and see it disappear. Well, now, you know, that went from currency to plastic to now digital payment. So now, and I am the first one to run in the store and just tap my phone and keep moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. But unless you understand that money is actually coming out of something, you don't know that it's disappearing. And a lot of people aren't having that conversation. So consequently, there is a scarcity mentality when it comes to money because you think, oh my God, if I spend too much, I'm not going to have enough to pay for, you know, milk, bread, gas at inflated prices, all of the things. So that, that education does need to occur. And now on the plus side, there are some good resources now with technology that can help you manage those as long as you know they're available. And oftentimes what we find out is that in the conversations with the people we work with, they don't know that we exist. They don't know that these tools exist. So a lot of what we do is educate them on whether it's apps, websites, digital trackers, all of those things that can help you with a plan. How do we, at this point, all kind of work together to come up with, here are some basics. If someone's listening, and they're thinking, I, I am the person you are speaking to right now. <laughs> Money is scary to me. I never learned anything about it. I don't know what these tools are. What are some basics then that we can help provide to people? Look for this. Try and balance this. Ask these questions. If you don't know the questions to ask, ask these questions because they will help you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I would say very surface level, you know, creating a working Excel spreadsheet budget. Right. Um, asking yourself, you know, what do I recall as far as my first memories when it comes to savings? Do I have a savings philosophy? What am I saving for? Am I saving for a rainy day? You know, am I saving for, you know, a big event like a wedding, having a child, you know, owning a business and things of that nature? What are assets and liabilities? You know, um, what do my expenses look like? And just, you know, kind of painting the picture so that you know, you have something tangible that kind of helps you illustrate, hey, am I going in the right direction? If not, people like us, you know, can be a resource. So the first thing I would say is everybody, everybody needs a financial advisor. And there's a giant misconception that financial advisors, all, one, you have to have a ton of money to have one. Mm. Ton is a technical term. Um, or um, that they're going to charge you a fee. And what oftentimes a lot of people don't realize is a lot of financial advisors don't charge a fee. And so every single person, okay, we'll say 97.5%, okay, have a barber or a hairstylist. Arguably, you could do that yourself, but mm -hmm. we're willing to pay to have a much better experience with someone who has the knowledge. Conceptually, it would make the same to do the same when it comes to money, but we don't do that. And so I would, I would counsel everyone to have someone in their corner who is a financial professional 
that can answer those questions. Because inevitably, whether it is tax time, whether it's getting a raise, whether it's a 401k, you are going to have some question when it comes to money and you need a trusted source that you feel confident you can ask a question to and you're not going to be judged. And I tell everybody this when we sit down and talk, it doesn't have to be me. There are tons of people in my seat and if you don't feel comfortable with me, that's fine. Just make sure you find someone to put on your team that you are because everybody is going to go through a transition in this country where we go from accumulation to spending. And it is the scariest transition for people out there because if you've been saving for 40 years and then all of a sudden you walk into your job one day and say, hey, guys, I don't really like being here. I'm going home. <laughs> you then have to live off of your assets and it's a really scary moment. So you've got to make sure you've got a plan in place to make that transition. These are some great kind of starting and basics to get people's brains kind of ticking and moving. So what are some big topics when we think about financial literacy or financial planning, things that people should know? I know the word will came up at one point. If we're thinking about, you know, a family's legacy or if we're thinking about college or like what are kind of some buckets or topics people should be thinking about? And that goes for you know, a broad spectrum of ages too, from kids and making this less scary to adults that didn't have this thought process when being kids. And so maybe we're kind of still on that kid mentality. So what are some of these buckets and how do we address some of these? Sure. So when it comes to, to buckets, we'll, we'll say goals broadly, whether it's college, next car, retirement, what have you. If you're a parent trying to figure out how to have this conversation with your kids, what I always tell people is try to test drive money while you have the opportunity to, um, to catch them, right? You don't want your kid's first experience with money to be at college when you're not there. So it, this is, this, this is going to land like a lead balloon. I know it. But <laughs> think about giving your kids some money early on just to see how they react, right? Do you have the, the child that wants to run to the store and buy the, the next video game as soon as it comes out? Or do you have the kid that wants to put some aside and save it? Or do you have a child that wants to give, right? Once you get to see those characteristics, you can kind of shape and mold and have meaningful conversations before it's too late. Um, I work with a, a lot of professionals that went to advanced, um, went for advanced degrees and have a lot of student loan debt. Some of them had education on the front end. Some of them didn't. And we begin to have the conversations when they are 28 and 30 and 34 about interest rates. And oftentimes, a lot of people don't understand, hey, you can refinance student loan debt. You don't have to go get a credit card at 20%. Like, there, there are a lot of tools out there as long as you know they exist. And it's always humbling for me because these are people who have multiple degrees, are an extremely, extremely smart people, but were never educated on the financial side. Do we want to talk about the will bucket? I sure. know you brought that up. Yeah. And I know that was kind of a – why don't you go ahead and set okay. this up? Yeah, so what, what I find happens often – very often, is that um, grandma or grandpa will pass away, and the house may be in okay shape, mm -hmm. and then um, none of the children or grandchildren are interested in, in the house, mm -hmm. are interested in any of the belongings in the house, uh, because grandma, in her mind, always thought, well, when I pass away, I'm going to this bed is going to go to my, <laughs> my great-grandchild, right? But it's, it's the bed that grandma slept on for 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so the great-grandchild's not really – they've already got their bed, right, mm -hmm. in their house. And so, so you just have this piece of property that sits there because no one wants it, and then it, it caves in on itself, and then it's a big problem. And then we as metro government end up having to cut the grass for it, and, and eventually we end up having to pay to tear it down and – everything that goes with that. And so um, I, I would like for you all, if you could just talk about that a little bit and how do people go about getting a will and is it strange to have one and all, all those kinds of things. Yeah, that's a great point. And that I'll share an anecdote with you here in a second. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right. Oftentimes people don't realize if they don't have a will, technically they do have a will and it's called dying intestate. And so the state will write your will for you. Rarely is that what you would want for any of your possessions. Every state is different. And what oftentimes I run into is people think, hey, if something happens to me, it'll all go to my spouse. Not the case. 
there is actually a, a tree of the direction it goes. Some goes to your spouse, some goes to your kids, some goes to your parents. And if you have a, a let's say you have a lot of kids or you have a blended family, it gets to be even more complicated. And so what we typically see is the, the grandmother who passes away, and then all of a sudden everyone has a sixth interest in this house, five of which want to sell it, one does not, and then the house just sits there. Um, so one of the single best things you can do is just do your estate planning. Now, again, via technology, there are some templated things you can do online, and this is probably not the forum to give anyone a public shout-out, but there are some tools online, or you can find a, an attorney locally who knows all the local state laws and can walk you through that process. Some basic estate planning, whether it's a power of attorney, living will, simple trust, those things are relatively inexpensive. The more complicated things that you want to have happen, of course, it's going to cost you more. But it's the easiest thing to get that done. And I told you that the anecdote I'd share with you, my sister and I found out that we were the owners of some property way out in the state that we had no idea existed. Mm -hmm. So as this might have been pre-pandemic. You know, we get a letter because that municipality has been cutting the grass and eventually was tearing it down and had to lean on the property. As grand, great-grandchildren of the property owner, we had no idea that it existed. And all that person had to do, and mind you, this is a person who was in the industry, right? And all that person had to do was do their estate planning, and we never have that issue. So instead, my sister and I are going through the process, you know, back then of trying to find an attorney in that county and, and looking up the address and all of the stuff that comes with it. So you're right, it's a huge problem, and it could have been rectified just by having an estate plan. Absolutely. So, so please hear me when I say, please have a will. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. it, it, but I think sometimes people feel like, well, if I go to the attorney and talk about a will, that means something bad's coming my way. But I, I think it's just smart financial planning mm -hmm. so that you can leave a legacy for your kids and your, and your grandkids and, and to, to pass that down in an organized fashion. Yeah, and you mentioned legacy. You know, one of the coolest things that, that PJ and I do in our role is help people define and create that legacy. And it means something different to everybody. You know, whether it is making sure that kids or grandkids go to school or making sure that that real estate passes down and always stays in the family. The really cool thing about estate planning and creating that legacy is anything is fair game. You just got to write it down and execute it. Execution is the issue sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Execution right. is the issue. Right. And I know you, you touched on this, and I think you hit the nail on the head as well. When people think about a will, again, that's scary because they don't maybe want to face some fears or face some discussion of what do I do with this or am I authoritative enough to make the decision no matter what anyone else who will be left behind feels. This is what I want to do or this is how I want to leave this behind. And so those, those are big questions to think about and big topics to think about before just launching in and kind of doing on that on your own without any direction, not knowing the questions to ask, would be overwhelming. They are. I, I can remember when my father passed away and we were dealing with his estate and my daughter was looking at me saying, please don't have me <laughs> cleaning out your stuff and, you know, have a plan for this. I just want to be able to open an envelope and be able to handle it. And, uh, and so uh, when my, my dad at one point, he had said, Hey, I need you to find me an attorney because I need a will. But it was me that didn't want to because it was oh, like wow. him saying, hey, the end is coming. Mm. And I did not want to acknowledge that. But, you know, he knew it was best. Yeah. So a lot of these topics, um, and we've touched on this, can be overwhelming, especially to a, a parent trying to figure out how to talk about any of this to a child, but also just really confusing to a kid. And from, you know, knee biters mm -hmm. to high schoolers, we're talking. These are really big topics. So how would you recommend um, attacking some of these? And are there certain topics for certain age groups that just make sense to start talking about? One, I wouldn't overthink it. They have the internet. They're going to find out anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the <same> this is <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> so go, go ahead and have the conversation. Yeah. Now, you don't have to tell them everything. Right. Um, oftentimes, PJ and I will have um, family meetings where we'll have the first generation there with the kids. And what becomes really cool about this is we talk in generalities, maybe not numbers specific per se, but okay, hey, you know, mom and dad, what was your experience with money growing up? 
because as as children, we all have a, a sense of normalcy, right? We see the neighborhood we live in, we see the cars we drive, we see the, you know, the friends that our parents hang out with. That might not have been the normalcy that they grew up with. And so having having your parents share their story and their journey with how they grew up and how they interacted with money with the generation before them can really help shape the future of the next generation and help them appreciate way more of what they have versus, is, you know, I want a new phone or I want to go on a trip just because we have. Understanding where they came from can be really helpful in shaping that journey. I think we've hit so many topics in such a short amount of time. I don't want to overwhelm people with too much information <laughs> um, because I I really want this conversation to kind of be intriguing to people to that if they've never thought of some of these topics, um, now there's a question in their mind of like, okay, now I can ask this or now I can figure this out. Um, what would you say kind of as we we get ready to leave this table would be your number one piece of advice to just any Joe Schmo listening? To to all the, all the Joe Schmoes. (laughs) Sally comes soon and Johnny come lately. I would tell all of them, just find someone you can put on your team. Mm -hmm. Right. And and again, it doesn't have to be a PJ or me. There's tons of us out there. Find someone that you can trust that you can ask these questions to. Okay. I would say, um, you know, take it upon yourself to kind of categorize this as a level of being socially responsible, right? Um, I think one thing we kind of mentioned as it related to this aspect of fear, um, you know, if I were to ask someone, you know, do you think you're going to die tomorrow? You know, no one's going to say yes, right? So I think um, just understanding that, you know, there's a, a reality that, you know, comes with um, being prepared and, you know, um, there's no better way to prepare other than, you know, financial planning. So, yeah. President James, what would be your advice? Whether you want to talk to Metro right now, if you want a soapbox right now, <laughs> if you just want to talk to your constituents, I don't know what you need right now, but here's I, your moment to talk. I, I would say my number one concern for my district is what I was harping on earlier is wills. Mm-hmm. And I would ask that the people that are hearing our voices right now, I don't care if you're 20 years old or 60 years old or however old you are, it's not too early to prepare for whatever may happen, right? And so please prepare a will because it really helps us in Metro government because uh, we, we had to hire a whole team of lawyers just to deal with this problem. Mm. It's, it's such a big problem. Wow. And so um, I, I would encourage you, just take a moment, make an appointment with somebody to work on a will. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would also encourage everybody out there to take a moment – and, and work on a budget and get on the internet and Google financial planners, Louisville, Kentucky, and, and, and pick one out and, 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 just, and just make that phone call and make an appointment and, and start working on your future. Mm-hmm. I think working on your future, I mean, that, that's so great to say to kind of wrap all this up because so much of the fear comes down to like, well, I'm not going to tackle that because it's scary. But you're setting yourself back if you don't. And so maybe a lot of success seems unattainable if you don't have those questions and you don't know the right steps or you don't have someone in your corner. So, I mean, is it attainable? Depends what the goal is. So the the long story is yes. And if you think about, you know, I was driving down here and I love fall in Louisville because of the, all the colors of the trees, but – if you think about all those trees, they're only there because someone planned and planted the seed. So we get the fresh air and we get the shade and we get everything else because somebody else took the time to plant the tree. And so what I would toss out is this is our time to plant the tree for somebody in the future. It's a great, great, great way to look at it. I like Beautiful that. Beautiful analogy. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, thank you so much for all being here and joining this conversation. Um, I hope it does spark some intrigue with someone. And if there's a question that you've thought of for the first time just by listening to the great experts we have here at the table, follow up on that. Um, Whether that's Googling or that's going to your parents or asking your friend or your neighbor, what do I do next? Because now I have this goal or now I have this question. Um, Then we've then we've succeeded at this table so thank you so much for joining us thanks for having thank us. you for having thank us. you thank you everybody and you did a great job once again katrina oh thanks <laughs> <laughs>